There's this pervasive idea that the differences in toy preferences between boys and girls is this socially constructed phenomenon that is taught from a young age, and that were these supposed societal pressures not to exist, boys and girls would like the same toys. But what does the science say? It's time for Reality Check. Broadly speaking, there are two sides to this argument, and they can be summed up by the phrase nature versus nurture. The nature side claims that differences in girls and boys' choices of Hot Wheels or Barbie is rooted in basic biological differences in things like hormone levels and brain structure, and is not a learned preference. The nurture side claims that what's really important is what these kids are exposed to, in terms of gender-conforming messages from parents, peers, and society. Essentially, that boys and girls are conditioned into liking trucks or dolls. Which side is more accurate? Let's look at the evidence. First of all, we should answer the question, do boys and girls actually differ in their toy preferences? If given a selection of both, will a divide emerge between males and females in their chosen plaything? Well, take a look at this study. Children, either male or female, aged 3 to 8, were placed in front of a line of toys such as trucks, dolls, and books. Each child was allowed to play with whichever toy they liked for 12 minutes, and the amount of time each child spent playing with each toy was recorded. As you can see here, the boys spent significantly more time playing with cars and construction blocks as opposed to dolls and kitchen supplies, and the girls showed more variability in their preferences. There are other studies that assess these preferences in other ways, but they usually all show the same pattern. Based on these results, it looks like male and female children definitely differ in what they like to play with. But the important question here is why? Now, a pretty important theoretical point to consider here is that if gendered preferences were entirely learned, non-human animals would show no gendered preference for human toys. It makes sense, right? A group of monkeys will not have been exposed to messages about what toys boys like and what toys girls like. In fact, they will have never seen human toys before in their life. If toy preferences were entirely socially determined, then monkeys, who have no such social conditioning, should show no clear gendered preference. And as luck would have it, an experiment was conducted to look at just this. A group of rhesus monkeys, 23 females and 11 males, were the subjects. They were all kept inside a little box until the trial began. For each trial, two toys would be placed 10 meters apart in the outside area. One of the toys would always be a wheeled toy, such as a truck or car, and the other toy would always be a plush toy, i.e. a stuffed animal. For 25 minutes, the monkeys would roam free, and the researchers watched what happened. For each of the seven trials, researchers would record any interactions with any toy, how long those interactions lasted, and the sex of the monkey involved in that interaction. But what were the results? Incredibly, the researchers found that the male monkeys interacted with the wheel toys significantly more frequently than they did with the plush toys, and also spent significantly longer with the wheel toys. The female monkeys showed no significant preference for one over the other, for both the frequency of interactions and the duration. Although, the males and females didn't show a significant difference for their interaction frequency or duration of play with wheeled toys, meaning they played with them for about the same amount of time, and although the males interacted with the plush toys significantly less frequently than the females, the amount of time they spent with the plush toys didn't significantly differ between males and females. Now, before we discuss these results and exactly what they mean, you've probably noticed that I've been using the word significant a lot and chucking P equals and a bunch of scary numbers at you as well. And that's no accident. It's a concept in statistics that might seem pretty confusing at first, so for now just consider a significant result as a definite difference between groups and a non-significant result as being any differences that do exist might just be due to chance. I'll explain what this means in a later video, but hopefully that'll clear up some of the confusion for now. So, you might be scratching your head right now and wondering what to make of these results. 
The male monkeys were definitely more interested in the wheel toys, and the female monkeys seemed to not really care what kind of toy they were playing with. And although male monkeys initiated play with the wheel toys at a higher frequency than the females, overall, the male and female monkeys played with the wheel toys for about the same amount of time. How can this possibly happen? Well, I'm not sure how a difference that appears this large didn't end up being statistically significant, and it's difficult to work out from the data in the paper, but for now, we can't assume that there's a genuine difference in the duration of time male and female monkeys played with plush toys. It could have been that the females interacted with toys just more in general, and that's kind of skewed the results a bit, but like I said, we can't really be sure. What can be taken from these results is that even in the complete absence of any kind of social conditioning related to toys, male rhesus monkeys show a clear preference for wheel toys over plush toys. The question here is why? Well, the assumption here is that if social conditioning wasn't involved, then there must be a fundamental difference between male and female rhesus monkeys that makes the males have such a polarized preference for wheel toys. I'll expand a bit later on exactly what this difference is likely to be. But wait, what about the female monkeys? They showed no clear preference for one toy over the other. Surely this disproves that biology is responsible for toy preferences. And the strangest thing about this point is the fact that female monkeys showing no distinct preference actually supports the role of biology in toy preferences. How? Well, remember that first study I talked about, where toys were placed in a line and children got to choose what they wanted to play with? In that study, the pattern in male and female preferences was very similar to these monkey preferences. Remember, males showed a clear preference for the masculine toys, which included wheel toys, and the females didn't show a clear preference, just like the monkeys. The fact that these two results are so similar in two closely related species suggests that social conditioning really doesn't play that important of a role. You might think that I should just end the video here, and we could conclude that biological differences between males and females are entirely responsible for gendered toy preferences. Well, this doesn't tell us what exactly that biological difference is likely to be. Thankfully, I'm going to try and figure that out with one more piece of evidence. Now, again, the nurture side of the argument posits that biology is not what's important in determining differences between what girls and boys like to play with, and that these preferences are learned by cues and messages from the world around them. Now, it's often difficult to research just how much influence things like these have on gendered behavior, because it's usually very difficult to separate biological from environmental effects, and study the effects of each individually. You'd have to intentionally raise a boy as a girl, for example, to try and socialize them to be a female, and then see what kind of toys they like to play with. Children like this do exist, uh, but research on them is scarce, and I was unable to find any studies that look at their toy preferences in a behavioral way, by letting them just play and see what they do. So the results aren't really comparable to what we've seen so far. But... What if there was a way to get as close as possible to seeing just how effective both biology and socialization are at influencing children's toy preferences in the same children? Sounds crazy, right? Well, such research does exist. Remember that study at the start of the video? Where boys and girls were placed in front of a line of toys and researchers recorded how much time each child spent playing with each toy? Well, there were two other groups of children in that study, and they were boys and girls born with a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH for short. This is a genetic condition that, while not only being a real mouthful to say, is also very important for helping understand which parts of gendered behavior are biological and which are socially conditioned. But what exactly is this condition? There are a lot of different forms of it, but the kind we're interested in causes babies in the womb to generate higher than usual levels of androgens, or male sex hormones, like testosterone. The level of androgens you're exposed to prenatally, or in the womb, is believed to alter your body and brain structure, 
And because males are normally supposed to generate a lot more of these than girls, they're believed to be responsible for a lot of the neurological differences between males and females at birth, and potentially the reason why males seem to naturally prefer trucks over dolls. Don't believe me? I don't blame you. It sounds too simple to be true. But before you throw me out, just think for a second. If androgens are responsible for changing the structure of the developing male brain and making it more masculine, then what effects would high levels of androgens have on the developing female brain if they're not supposed to be there normally? Well, the idea is that if the developing female was exposed to higher than normal levels of androgens, their bodies and brains will become more masculinized, and despite being female, they'll display behavior more typical of males. Now, this condition also frequently causes physical abnormalities in baby girls, such as ambiguous genitalia, which usually have to be surgically corrected shortly after birth to become functional. After this, girls with CAH usually look just like any other regular girl, and will thus be raised as girls. So essentially, what they're growing up with is some masculine biological influences, but the feminine social pressure. It's worth pointing out that developing males can also be affected by CAH, but it doesn't really do all that much, since they're already being exposed to high levels of androgens. And here's the interesting part. If we gave the same standardized toy preference test to girls with CAH, what do you think they would play with? Would their choice of favorite toys resemble that of boys or of girls? Let's take a look. When these CAH girls had the line of toys in front of them and got to choose what to play with, they spent significantly more time playing with boys' toys than with girls' toys. When the normal girls showed no clear preference. What's even more, the CAH girls played with the boys' toys for about twice as much as their same-sex relatives, who were also tested. The CAH girls also played significantly less with the girls' toys than the normal girls. And the most interesting part? The CAH girls played with the boys' toys for pretty much exactly the same amount of time as the boys. The comparison for how much CAH girls played with girls' toys compared to the boys uh, isn't explicitly stated, but from the graph, it looks to be very similar. So, it seems that prenatal exposure to high levels of androgens in girls can create almost exactly the same toy preferences than those of regular boys. But wait, I hear you think. What if, because of their condition, their parents raised them to be more masculine, and this is what caused their manly love for trucks? Well, the researchers attempted to check for this. Parents were asked to respond to the yes or no statement, I encourage my child to act as a girl should. There was no significant difference between what parents said if their daughter had CAH or not. Now, if you're a hardcore socialization theorist, you could still argue that the parents may have still unconsciously treated their daughters differently, or maybe just not answered the question honestly, but as it stands, socialization is unlikely to be entirely responsible for how different the toy preferences of CAH girls are from normal girls. Because when you give female rhesus monkeys, the same species we talked about earlier, this same condition, they show more masculinized behavior. Sadly, I couldn't find an accessible study that looked specifically at how these special girl monkeys play with toys, but as you can see here, the average for all these other kinds of behaviors, such as different kinds of mounting behaviors, rough playing, and initiation of play, is higher on average for female monkeys that have had early exposure and late exposure to androgens in the womb. Granted, I'm unsure how much early and late exposure is related to CAH in humans, and the exposure in this study doesn't quite elicit the same behavior as males, as dramatically as our human study. But the point here is that again, in the absence of direct social conditioning, just manipulating hormone behavior in the womb can increase the level of gendered behavior in rhesus monkeys. It's also worth pointing out that the early exposure monkeys were the only ones whose genitals were masculinized, and the late exposure monkeys resembled normal females in appearance, so the differences in their behavior are unlikely to be due to them just being treated differently by the other monkeys, or their parents. 
So why wasn't the masculinization of the female monkeys as extreme as it was for our human girls? Well, I'm not really sure. It could be that CAH in humans has a more pronounced effect on gendered behavior. It could be that CAH doesn't just cause an increase in prenatal androgens, but affects behavior in other biological ways as well. Also, keep in mind, none of the behaviors in the monkey study involve playing with toys, so the results might not be totally comparable anyway. This could just be a bizarre sample, or it could have something to do with some kind of social conditioning. The fact of the matter is, introducing a fundamental biological difference in developing females can make them act a lot more like males in their toy preferences. Almost completely mimicking them, in fact. Furthermore, the experimenters measuring the amount of time the boys and girls were playing with the toys had no idea whether the child they were watching had CAH or not, so it's unlikely that the study was rigged in any way. And in case you're curious, the males with CAH were pretty much the same as normal males, so no surprise there. To conclude, not only do monkeys with no social conditioning have similar toy preferences to human children, but girls who were raised to be girls with some male hormone exposure in the womb also mimic male toy preferences. So what do you think? Is there still a strong case for socialization in causing gendered toy preferences? Up to you. If you think I've made any mistakes or know of any interesting counter-research, feel free to let me know. But for those of you thinking about giving a boy a Barbie, feel free. But he probably won't play with it.